The Sheep Pig by Dick King Smith. Chapter 1 Guess My Weight. What's that noise? said Mrs. Hoggett, sticking her comfortable round red face out the kitchen window. Listen, there it is again. Did you hear it? What a racket. What a row. Anybody thinks somebody's been murdered? Oh, dearie, dimmy. Whatever is it? You listen to it, will you? Farmer Hoggett listened. From the usually quiet valley below the farm came a medley of sounds. The umpa ump of a brass band, the shouts of children, the rattle and thump of a skittle alley, and every now and then a very high, very loud and very angry sounding squealing, lasting perhaps ten seconds. Farmer Hoggett pulled out an old pocket watch as big, as round as a saucer, and looked at it. Fairy starts at two, he said. It started. I know that, said Mrs. Hoggett, because I'm late now with all these here cakes and jams and pickles and preserves as is meant to be on the produce stall. It's very minute. And who's going to take them there? I'd like to know. Why, you are. But before he does, what's that noise? The squealing sounded again. That noise? Mrs. Hoggett nodded a great many times. Everything she did was done at great length, whether it was speaking or simply nodding her head. Farmer Hoggett, on the other hand, never wasted his energy on his words. Pig, he said. Mrs. Hoggett nodded a lot more. Oh, he thought it was pig. Oh, he said to myself, that's pig, that is. Only nobody round here do keep pigs. Tis all sheep for miles about. That's a pig doing, I said to myself. Anybody think he was killing the poor thing? Have a look when you take all this stuff down, which you better do now. Come and give us a hand. I can do it in the back of the Land Rover. Tisn't raining, won't hurt. Wipe your boots before he comes in. Yeah, said Farmer Hoggett. When he'd driven down to the village and made his delivery to the produce stall, Farmer Hoggett walked across the green, past the hoopla stall and the coconut shy and the Aunt Sally and the skittles and the band to the source of the squealing noise which came every now and again from a small pen of hurdles in a far corner against the churchyard wall. By the pen sat the vicar, notebook in hand, a cardboard box on the table in front of him. On the hurdles hung a notice. Guess my weight, ten pence a go. Inside was a little pig. As Farmer Hoggett watched, a man leaned over and picked it out of the pen. He hefted it in both hands, frowning and pursing his lips in a considering way, while all the time the piglet struggled madly and yelled blue murder. The moment it was put down, it quietened. Its eyes, bright, intelligent eyes, met the farmer's, and they regarded one another. One saw a tall, thin, brown-faced man with very long legs, and the other saw a small, fat, pinky-white animal with very short ones. Oh, come along, Mr. Hoggett, said the vicar. You never know. It could be yours for ten pence. Guess his weight correctly, and at the end of the day, you could be taking him home. Don't keep pigs, said Farmer Hoggett. He stretched out a long arm and scratched its back. Gently he picked it up and held it before his face. It stayed quite still and made no sound. That's funny, said the vicar. Every time so far that someone has picked him up, he screamed his head off. It seems to like you. You'll have to have a guess. Carefully, Farmer Hoggett put the piglet back in the pen. Carefully, he took a tenpence piece from his pocket and dropped it in the cardboard box. Carefully, he ran one finger down the list of guesses already in the vicar's notebook. Quite a variation, said the vicar. Anything from twenty pounds to forty so far. He wrote down Mr. Hoggett and waited, pencil poised. Once again, slowly, thoughtfully, the farmer picked the piglet up. Once again it remained still and silent. Thirty one pounds, said Farmer Hoggett. He put the little pig down again. And a quarter, he said. Thirty one pounds and a quarter. Thirty one and a quarter pounds. Yes, thank you, Mr. Hoggett. We shall be weighing the little chap at about half past four. It will be gone by then. Oh, well, we can always telephone you if you should be lucky enough to win him. We never win nothing. As he walked back across the green, the sound of the pigs yelling rang out as someone else had a go.
You never do win nothing, said Mrs. Hoggett at tea time, when her husband, in a very few words, explained matters. Though I've often thought I like a pig, we could feed none scraps. It'd come just right for Christmas time. Just think, two nice hams, two sides of bacon, pork chops, kidneys, liver, chitlin, chocolates, gives his blood for a black pudding. There's the phone. Farmer Hoggett picked it up. Oh, he said. Chapter 2 There. Is that nice? In the farmyard, Fly, the black and white collie, was beginning the training of her four puppies. For some time now, they'd shown an instinctive interest in anything that moved, driving it away or bringing it back, turning it to left or right, in fact, herding it. They'd begun with such things as passing beetles, but were now ready, Fly considered, for larger creatures. She set them to work on Mrs. Hoggett's ducks. Already the puppies were beginning to move as sheepdogs do, seeming to creep rather than walk, heads held low, ears pricked, eyes fixed on the angrily quacking birds as they manoeuvred them about the yard. Good boys, said Fly, leave them now, here comes the boss. The ducks went grumbling off to the pond, and the five dogs watched as Farmer Hoggett got out of the Land Rover. He lifted something out of a crate in their back and carried it into the stables. What was that, Mum? said one of the puppies. That was a pig. What would the boss do with it? Eat it, said Fly, when it's big enough. Will he eat us? said another rather nervously. When we're big enough. Bless you, said his mother. People only eat stupid animals, like sheep and cows and ducks and chickens. They don't eat clever ones like dogs. So big the stupid, said the puppies. Fly hesitated. On the one hand, having been born and brought up in sheep country, she had in fact never been personally acquainted with a pig. On the other, like most mothers, she did not wish to appear ignorant in front of her children. Yes, she said, they're stupid. At this point, there came from the kitchen window a long burst of words like the rattle of a machine gun, answered by a single shot from the stables, and Farmer Hoggett emerged and crossed the yard towards the farmhouse with his loping stride. "'Come on,' said the collie bitch. "'I'll show you.' The floor of the stables had not rung to a horse's hoof for many years, but it was a useful place for storing things. The hens foraged about there, and sometimes laid their eggs in the old wooden mangers. The swallows built their nests against its roof beams with mud from the duck pond, and rats and mice lived happy lives in its shelter until the farm cats cut them short.' At one end of the stables were two loose boxes with boarded sides topped by own rails. One served as a kennel for Fly and her puppies. The other sometimes housed six sheep. Here, Farmer Hoggett had shut the piglet. A convenient stack of straw bales allowed the dogs to look down into the box through the bars. It certainly looks stupid, said one of the puppies, yawning. At the sound of the words, the piglet glanced up quickly. He put his head on one side and regarded the dogs with sharp eyes. Something about the sight of this very small animal standing all by itself in the middle of the roomy loose box touched Fly's soft heart. Already she was sorry that she had said pigs were stupid, for this one certainly did not appear to be so. Also, there was something dignified about the way it stood its ground, in a strange place, confronted with strange animals. How different from the silly sheep, who at the mere sight of a dog would run aimlessly about crying wolf, wolf in their empty-headed way. Hello, she said. Who are you? I'm a large white, said the piglet. Blimey, said one of the puppies. If that's a large white, what's a small one like? And they all four sniggered. Be quiet, snapped Fly. Just remember that five minutes ago you didn't even know what a pig was. And to the piglet, she said kindly, I expect that's your breed, dear. I mean, what's your name? I don't know, said the piglet. Well, what did your mother call you? To tell you apart from your brothers and sisters, said Fly. And then wish she hadn't, for at the mention of his family, the piglet began to look distinctly unhappy. His little forehead wrinkled, and he gulped, and his voice trembled as he answered. She called us all the same. And what was that, dear? Babe, said the piglet, and the puppies began to giggle until their mother silenced them with a growl. But that's a lovely name, she said. Would you like us to call you that? It'll make you feel more at home. At this last word, the little pig's fears fell even further. Oh, wonder.
my mum, he said very quietly. At that instant the collie bitch made up her mind that she would foster this unhappy child. Go out into the yard and play, she said to the puppies, and she climbed to the top of the straw stack and jumped over the rail and down into the loose box beside the piglet. Listen, babe, she said, you've got to be a brave boy. Everyone has to leave their mother. It's all part of growing up. I did so when I was your age, and my puppies will have to leave me quite soon. But I'll look after you if you like. Then she licked his little snout with a warm, rough tongue, her plumed tail wagging. There, is that nice? she said. A little while later, Farmer Hoggett came into the steerables with his wife to show her his prize. They looked over the loose box door and saw, to their astonishment, Fly curled round the piglet. Exhausted by the drama of the day, he lay fast asleep against his new-found foster parent. "'Well, you look at that!' said Mrs Hoggett. "'That old Fly! She'll mother anything! Kitten, ducklings, baby chick! She looked after all they by now! Tis a pig, ain't he lovely? What a picture! Good job he don't know where he'll finish up, but he'll be big then, and we'll be glad to see the back of him, or the arms of him, <laughs> I should say, shan't us, I wonder how he get him all in the freezer. Pity, really, said Farmer Hoggett absently. Mrs Hoggett went back to her kitchen, shaking her head all the way across the yard at the thought of her husband's soft-heartedness. The farmer opened the loose box door, and to save the effort of a word, clicked his fingers to call the bitch out. As soon as Fly moved, the piglet walked and followed her, sticking so close to her that his snout touched her tail tip. Surprise forced Farmer Hoggett into speech. Fly, he said in amazement. Obediently as always, the collie bitch turned and trotted back to him. The bitch trotted behind her. Sit, said Farmer Hoggett. Fly sat, babe sat. Farmer Hoggett scratched his head. He could not think of anything to say. Chapter 3. Why can't I learn? By dark it was plain to Farmer Hoggett that whether he liked it or no, Fly had not four, but five children. All the long summer evening, Babe had followed Fly about the yard and buildings, aimlessly, it seemed, to the watching farmer, though of course this was not the case. It was, in fact, a conducted tour. Fly knew that if this foster child was to be allowed his freedom and the constant reassurance of her company for which he obviously craved, he must quickly learn, and patently he was a quick learner, his way about the place, and that he must be taught, as her puppies had been taught, how to behave like a good dog. A pig you may be, babe, she had begun by saying, but if you do as I tell you, I shouldn't be a bit surprised if the boss doesn't let you run about with us instead of shutting you up. He's a kind man, the boss is. I knew that, said Babe, when he first picked me up. I could feel it. I knew he wouldn't hurt me. You wait, began one of the puppies, and then stopped suddenly at his mother's warning growl. Though she said nothing, all four of her children knew immediately by instinct what she meant. Wait for what? said Babe. Uh, you wait half a tick, and we'll take you round and show you everything, said the first puppy hastily. Won't we, Mum? So Babe was shown all around the yard and the farm buildings, and introduced to the creatures who lived thereabouts. The ducks and chickens and other poultry. The farm cats. He saw no sheep, for they were all in the fields. Even in the first hour, he learned a number of useful lessons, as the puppies had learned before him, that cats scratch and hens peck, that turning your back on the turkey cock meant getting your bottom bitten, that chicks are not for chasing and eggs are not for eating. You do as I do, said Fly, and you'll be all right. She thought for a moment. There is one thing, though, babe, she said, and she looked across at the back door of the farmhouse. If I go in there, you stay outside and wait for me, understand? Aren't pigs allowed in there? asked Babe. Not live ones, said one of the puppies, but he said it under his breath. No, dear, said Fly. Well, not yet anyway, she thought. But the way you're going on, I shouldn't be surprised at anything. Funny, she thought. I feel really proud of him. He learns so quick, quick as any sheepdog. That night, the loose box in which Babe had first been put was empty. In the next door one, all six animals slept in the straw together. Though he didn't tell his wife, 
Farmer Hoggett had not had the heart to shut the piglet away, so happy was it in the company of the dogs. At first the puppies had not been equally happy at the idea. Mum, they said, he'll wet the bed. Nonsense, said Fly. If you want to do anything, dear, you go outside. There's a good boy. I nearly said, there's a good pup, she thought. Whatever next? In fact, Nadir's have followed. Babe became so dog-like, what with coming when Fly came and sitting when Fly sat, and much preferring dog's food to anything else he was offered, that Farmer Hogg had caught himself half expecting, when he patted the piglet, that it would wag its tail. He would not have been surprised if he had tried to accompany Fly when he called her to go with him on his morning rounds, but it had stayed in the stables playing with the puppies. You stop with the boys, babe, Fly had said, while I go and see to the sheep. I shan't be long. What sheep? the piglet said when she had gone. The puppies rolled about in the straw. Don't you know that, you silly babe, said one. Sheep are animals with thick woolly coats and thick woolly heads, and men can't look after them without the help of the likes of us, said the fourth. Why do they need you? said babe. Because we're sheep dogs, they all cried together and ran off up the yard. Babe thought about this matter of sheep and sheepdogs a good deal during the first couple of weeks of his life on the Hoggett's farm. In that time, Fly's puppies, now old enough to leave home, had been advertised for sale, and Fly was anxious to teach them all she could before they went out into the world. Daily she made them practice on the ducks, while Babe sat beside her and watched with interest, and daily their skills improved, and the ducks lost weight and patience. Then there came, one after another, four farmers, four tall, long-legged men who felt of sheep, and each picked his puppy and paid his money, while Fly sat and watched her children leave to start their work in life. As always, she felt a pang to see each one go, but this time after the last had left, she was not alone. "'It's nice, dear,' she said to Babe. "'I've still got you.' But not for all that long, she thought. Poor little chap, in six months or so he'd be fit to kill. At least he doesn't know it. She looked fondly at him. This foster child that now called her mum. He had picked it up, naturally enough, from the puppies, but it pleased her to hear it, now more than ever. Mum, said Babe. Yes, dear. They've gone off to work sheep, haven't they? Yes, dear. Because they're sheepdogs, like you. You're useful to the boss, aren't you? Because you're a sheepdog. Yes, dear. Well, Mum, yes, dear, why can't I learn to be a sheep pig? Chapter 4 You were polite, young chap. After the last of the puppies had left, the ducks heaved a general sigh of relief. They looked forward to a peaceful day and paid no attention when, the following morning, Fly and Babe came down to the pond and sat and watched them as they squatted and splattered in its soupy green depths. They knew that the old dog would not bother them, and they took no notice of the strange creature at her side. They'll come out and walk up the yard in a minute, said Fly. Then you can have a go at fetching them back, if you like. Oh, yes, please, said Babe excitedly. The collie bitch looked fondly at her foster child. Sheep pig indeed, she thought. The idea of it. The mere sight of him would probably send the flock into the next county. Anyway... He'd never get near them on those little short legs. Let him play with the ducks for a day or two and he'll forget all about it. When the ducks did come up out of the water and marched noisily past the piglet, she half expected him to chase after them, as the puppies usually did at first. But he sat very still, his ears cocked, watching her. All right, said Fly, let's see how you get on. Now then, first thing is, you've got to get behind them, just like I have to with the sheep. If the boss wants me to go round the right side of them, that's the side where the stables are, he says away to me. If he wants me to go round to the left, that's where the Dutch barn is, he says come by. OK? Yes, Mum. Right then. Away to me, Babe, said Fly. At first, not surprisingly, Babe's efforts met with little success. There were no problems with getting round the ducks. Even with his curious little seesawing canter, he was much faster than they. But the business of bringing the whole flock back to fly was not he found all that easy. Either he pressed them too hard and they broke up and fluttered all over the place, or he was too gentle and held back, and they waddled away in twos and threes. Come and have a rest, dear, called Fly after a while. Leave the silly things alone. 
They're not worth upsetting yourself about. I'm not upset, Mum, said Babe, just puzzled. I mean, I told them what I wanted them to do, but they didn't take any notice of me. Why not? Because you weren't born to it, thought Fly. You haven't got the instinct to dominate them, to make them do what you want. It's early days yet, Babe dear, she said. Do you suppose, said Babe, that if I ask them politely... Ask them politely? What an idea! Just imagine me doing that with the sheep. Please, will you go through that gateway? Would you kindly walk into that pen? Oh no, dear. You'll never get anywhere that way. You've got to tell them what to do. Doesn't matter whether it's ducks or sheep. They're stupid and dogs are intelligent. That's what you have to remember. But I'm a pig! Pigs are intelligent too, said Fly firmly. Asked them politely, she thought. <laughs> Whatever next? What happened next, later that morning in fact, was that Babe met his first sheep. Farmer Hoggett and Fly had been out around the flock, and when they returned, Fly was driving before her an old lame ewe, which they penned in the loose box where the piglet had originally been shot. Then they went away up the hill again. Babe made his way to the stables, curious to meet this, the first of the animals that he planned one day to work with, but he could not see into the box. He snuffled under the bottom of the door, and from the inside there came a cough and the sharp stamp of a foot, and then the sound of a hoarse, complaining voice. Wolves, 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 it said. They do never leave a body alone. Nay, 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 all day long. Go here, go there. Do this, do that. What do you want now? Can't you give us a bit of peace, wolf? I'm not a wolf, said Babe under the door. Oh, I knows all that, said the sheep sourly. Calls yourself a sheepdog, I knows that. But you can't fool none of us. You're a wolf like the rest of them, given half a chance. You look at us and you see these lamb jobs. Go away, wolf. But I'm not a sheepdog either, said Babe, and he scrambled up a stack of straw bales and looked over the bars. You see, he said, we'll all be dipped, said the old sheep, peering up at him. No more you ain't. What are you? Pig, said Babe. Large white. What are you? You, said the sheep. No, not me. You. What are you? I'm a you. Mum was right, thought Babe. They certainly are stupid. But if I'm going to learn how to be a sheep pig, I must try and understand them. And this might be a good chance. Perhaps I can make a friend of this one. My name's Babe, he said in a jolly voice. What's yours? Ah, said the sheep. That's a nice name, said Babe. What's the matter with you, Ma? Foot rot said the sheep, holding up a foreleg. And I've got a nasty cough, she coughed. And I'm not as young as I thought I was. You don't look very old to me, said Babe politely. A look of pleasure came over the sheep's mournful face, and she lay down in the straw. Very civil of you to say so, she said. First kind word I've had since I were a little lamb and she belched loudly and began to chew a mouthful of cud. Though he did not quite know why, Babe said nothing to fly of his conversation with Ma. Farmer Hoggett had treated the sheep's foot and dipped a drench down its protesting throat, and now, as darkness fell, dog and pig lay side by side, their rest only occasionally disturbed by a rustling from the next-door box. Having at last set eyes on a sheep, Babe's dreams were immediately filled with the creatures, all lame, all coughing, all like the ducks, scattering wildly before his attempts to round them up. "'Go here, go there, do this, do that!' he squeaked furiously at them. But they took not a bit of notice, until at last the dream turned to a nightmare, and they all came hopping and hacking and mying after him, with hatred gleaming in their mad yellow eyes. "'Mum! Mum!' shouted Babe in terror. Ah, said a voice next door. It's all right, dear, said Fly. It's all right. Was it a nasty dream? Yes, yes. What were you dreaming about? Sheep, Mum. I expect it was because of that stupid old thing in there, said Fly. Shut up, she barked. Noisy old fool. And to Babe, she said, 
Now cuddle up, dear, and go to sleep. There's nothing to be frightened of. She licked his snout until it began to give out a series of regular snores. Sheep pig indeed, she thought. Why, the silly boy is frightened of the things. And she put her nose on her paws and went to sleep. Babe slept soundly the rest of the night and woke more determined than ever to learn all he could from their new neighbour. As soon as Fly had gone out on her rounds, he climbed the straw stack. Good morning, Ma, he said. I do hope you're feeling better today. The old ewe looked up. Her eyes, Babe was glad to see, looked neither mad nor hateful. I must say, she said, you're my polite young chap. Not like that wolf, shouting at me in the middle of the night. Never get no respect from they. Treat you like dirt they do. Bite you soon, let's look at you. Do they really? Ah, nip your hawks if you're a bit slow. And worse, some of them. Worse? Oh, ah. Ain't you never heard of worrying? I don't worry much. No, no, young un. I'm talking about sheep worrying. You get some wolves as'll chase sheep and kill em. Oh, said Babe, horrified. I'm sure Fly would never do that. Who's Fly? She's my... She's our dog. The, she's our dog here. The one that brought you in yesterday. Is that what she's called? No, she ain't a worrier. Just rude. All rules is rude to us sheep, see. Always have been. But I can run and nip and call us stupid. We bain't all that stupid. We just get confused. If only they just show a bit of common politeness. Just treat us a bit decent. Now if you was to come out into the field, a nice, well-mannered young chap like you, and ask me to go somewhere or do something politely like you would, why... I'd be only too delighted. <laughs> Chapter 5 Keep yelling, young'un. Mrs. Hoggett shook her head at least a dozen times. For the life of me, I can't see why you let a pig run all over the place like you do. Round and round the yard he do go, chasing my ducks about, shoving his nose in everything. Shouldn't wonder, but what he be out with you and Floy moving the sheep about for long? Why doesn't shut him up? He's running all his flesh off. He won't never be fit for Christmas. Easter more like. What do you call him? Just pig, said Farmer Hoggett. A month had gone by since the village fair. A month in which a lot of interesting things had happened to Babe. The fact that perhaps most concerned his future, though he did not know it, was that Farmer Hoggett had become fond of him. He liked to see the piglet pottering happily about the yard with Fly, keeping out of mischief, as far as he could tell, if he didn't count moving the ducks around. He did this now with a good deal of skill, the farmer noticed, even to the extent of being able, once, to separate the white ducks from the brown, although that must have been a fluke. The more he thought of it, the less Farmer Hoggett liked the idea of butchering pig. The other developments were in Bibb's education. Despite herself, Fly found that she took pleasure and pride in teaching him the ways of the sheepdog, though she knew that, of course, he would never be fast enough to work sheep. Anyway... The boss would never let him try. As for Ma, she was back with the flock. Her foot healed, her cough better. But all the time that she had been shut in the box, Babe had spent every moment that Fly was out of the stables chatting to the old ewe. Already he understood, in a way that Fly never could, the sheep's point of view. He longed to meet the flock, to be introduced. He thought it would be extremely interesting. Do you think I could, Ma? he had said. Good what, young un? Well, come and visit you when you go back to your friends. Oh, ar, you could do easy enough. You only got to go through the bottom gate and up the hill to the big field by the lane. Don't know what farmer'd say, though, or that wolf. Once Fly had slipped quietly in and found him perched on the straw stack. Babe! she had said sharply. You're not talking to that stupid thing, are you? Well, yes, Mum, I was. Save your breath, dear. You won't understand the word you say. Ma, said Ma. For a moment, Babe was tempted to tell his foster mother of what he had in mind, but something told him to keep quiet. Instead, he made a plan. He would wait for two things to happen. 
First, for Ma to rejoin the flock, and after that, for market day, when both the boss and his mum would be out of the way, then he would go up the hill. Towards the end of the very next week, two things had happened. Ma had been turned out, and a couple of days after that, Babe washed his fly, jumped into the back of the Land Rover, and it drove out of the yard and away. Babes were not the only eyes that watched its departure. At the top of the hill, a cattle lorry stood half hidden under a clump of trees at the side of the lane. As soon as the Land Rover disappeared from sight along the road to the market town, a man jumped hurriedly out and opened the gate into the field. Another backed the lorry into the gateway. Babe, meanwhile, was trotting excitedly up the hill to pay his visit to the flock. He came to the gate at the bottom of the field and squeezed under it. The field was steep and curved, and at first he couldn't see a single sheep. But then he heard a distant drumming of hooves, and suddenly the whole flock came galloping over the brow of the hill and down towards him. Around them ran two strange collies, lean, silent dogs that seemed to flow effortlessly over the grass. From high above came the sound of a thin whistle, and in easy partnership the dogs swept around the sheep and began to drive them back up the slope. Despite himself, Babe was caught up in the press of jostling, bleating animals and carried along with them. Around him rose a chorus of panting, protesting voices, some shrill, some hoarse, some deep and guttural, but all saying the same thing. Wolf! Wolf! cried the flock in dazed confusion. Small by comparison and short in the leg, Babe soon fell behind the main body, and as they reached the top of the hill, he found himself right at the back in company with old sheep who cried, Wolf! more loudly than any. Ma! he cried breathlessly. It's you! Behind them, one dog lay down at a whistle, and in front the flock checked as the other dog steadied them. In the corner of the field, the tailboard and wings of the cattle lorry filled the gateway, and the two men waited, sticks and arms outspread. Oh, hello, young un, puffed the old sheep. Fine day you chose to come by, I'll say. What is it? What's happening? Who are those men? asked Babe. Rustlers, said Ma. Them sheep rustlers. What do you mean? Thieves, young un. That's what I do mean. Sheep stealers. We'll all be in Dick Lorry before you can blink your eye. What can we do? Do? Ain't nothing we can do. Unless we can slip past, they say you're wolf. She made as if to escape, but the dog behind darted in, and she turned back. Again one of the men whistled, and the dog pressed. Gradually, held against the headland of the field by the second dog and the men, the flock began to move forward. Already the leaders were nearing the tailboard of the lorry. "'Wayne beat," said Marn mournfully. "'You run for it, young un. "'I will,' thought Babe, but not the way you mean.' Little as he was, he felt suddenly not fear but anger, furious anger that the boss's sheep were being stolen. My mum's not here to protect them, so I must, he said to himself bravely, and he ran quickly round the hedge side of the flock, and jumping them to the bottom of the tailboard, turned to face them. Please, he cried, I beg you, please don't come any further, if you would be so kind, dear, sensible sheep. His unexpected appearance had a number of immediate effects. The shock of being so politely addressed stopped the flock in its tracks, and the cries of wolf changed to murmurs of, In he lovely, and proper little gentleman. Mara told them something of her new friend, and now to see him in the flesh and to hear his well-chosen words released them from the dominance of the dogs. They began to fidget and look about for an escape route. This was opened for them when the men cursing quietly for above all things they were anxious to avoid too much noise sent the flanking dog to drive the pig away and some of the sheep began to slip past them next moment all was chaos angrily the dog ran at babe who scuttled away squealing at the top of his voice in a mixture of fright and fury the men closed on him sticks raised Desperately he shot between the legs of one, who fell with a crash, while the other, striking out madly, hit the rearguard dog as it came to help, and sent it yowling. In half a minute the carefully planned raid was ruined, as the sheep scattered everywhere. "'Keep yelling, young un,' bawled Ma, as she ran beside Babe. "'They won't never stop here with that row going on!' And suddenly all sorts of things began to happen, as those deafening squeals rang out over the quiet countryside. Birds flew startled from the trees, cows in nearby fields began to gallop about, dogs in distant farms to bark, passing motorists to stop and stare. In the farmhouse below, Mrs. Hoggett heard the noise as she had on the day of the fair, but now it was 
infinitely louder, the most piercing, nerve-tingling, ear-shattering burglar alarm. She dialed 999, but then talked for so long that by the time a patrol car drove up the lane, the rustlers had long gone. Snarling at each other and their dogs, they had driven hurriedly away with not one single sheet to show for their plans. "'You won't never believe it,' cried Mrs. Hoggett when her husband returned from the market. "'But we've had rustlers, just after you'd gone, it were. "'Come with a girl at the cattle lorry, they did. "'Police said they seen the tire marks in the gateway, "'and a chap in a car seen the lorry go by in a hurry, "'and there's been a lot of it about, and he gave the alarm as he did. "'He kept screaming and shaking and not to burst your eardrums, "'but we should have lost every sheep in the place if it were not for him. "'Tis him that's got us to thank.' "'Who?' said Farmer Hoggett. Im said his wife, pointing at Babe, who was telling Fly all about it. Don't ask me how he got there, or why he done it all. All I knows is he saved our bacon, and now I'm going to save his. He's stopping with us, just like another dog. Don't care if you get so big as ours, because I think if I'm going to stand by you and see him bitterate after what he's done for us today, you got another thing coming. What do you say at that? And a slow smile spread across Farmer Hoggett's long Chapter 6. Good Pig The very next morning, Farmer Hoggett decided that he would see if the pig would like to come when he went round the sheep with Fly. And after he thought, grinning to himself, he did not tell his wife. Seeing him walk down the yard, crook in hand, and hearing him call Fly, Babe was about to settle down for an after-breakfast nap. Then, to his surprise, he heard the farmer's voice again. Come, pig, said Farmer Hoggett, and to his surprise, the pig came. I expect it's because of what you did yesterday, said Fly proudly, as they walked to heel together up the hill. The boss must be very pleased with you, dear. You can watch me working. When they reached the lower gate, Farmer Hoggett opened it and left it open. He's going to bring them down into the home paddock away from the lane, said Fly quickly. You be quiet and keep out of the way. And she went to sit waiting by the farmer's right side. Come by, he said and Fly ran left up the slope as the sheep began to bunch over her. Once behind them, she addressed them in her usual way, that is to say, sharply. Move, fools! she snapped. Down the hill, if you know which way down is. But to her surprise, they did not obey. Instead, they turned to face her, and some even stamped and shook their heads at her, while a great chorus of bleating began. To Fly, sheep talk was just so much rubbish, to which she had never paid any attention. But Bay listening below, could hear clearly what was being said. And although the principal cry was the usual one, there were other voices saying other things. The contrast between the politeness with which they had been treated by yesterday's rescuer and the everlasting rudeness to which they were subjected by this or any other wolf brought mutinous thoughts into woolly heads, and words of defiance rang out. "'You got no manners! Why can't you us nicely? Treat us like what you do!' they cried and one hoarse voice which the pig recognised called loudly we don't want you wolf we want babe whereupon they all took it up we want babe they bleated babe 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 those behind pushed at the oars in front so they actually edged a pace or two nearer the dog for a moment it seemed to babe that fly was not going to be able to move them that she would lose this particular battle of wills but he had not reckoned with her years of experience. Suddenly, quick as a flash, she drove in on them with a growl and with a twisting leap sprang for the nose of the foremost animal. Babe heard the clack of her teeth as the ewe fell over backwards in fright, a fright which immediately ran through all. Defiant no longer, the flock poured down the hill, fly snapping furiously at their heels, and surged wildly through the gateway. "'No manners! No manners! No manners!' they cried, but an air of panic ran through them as they realised how rebellious they had been. How the wolf would punish them! They ran helter-skelter into the middle of the paddock, and wheeled as one to look back, ears pricked, eyes wide with fear. They puffed and blew, and Ma's hacking cough rang out. But to their surprise, they saw that the wolf had dropped by the gateway, and that after a moment the pig came trotting out to one side of them. Though Farmer Hoggart could not know what had caused the near revolt of the flock, he saw clearly that for some reason they had given Fly a hard time, and that she was angry. It was not like her to gallop sheep in that pell-mell fashion. Steady, he said curtly, as she harried the rear guard, and then down, and stay, and shut the gate. 
Shepherding suited Farmer Hoggett. There was no waste of words in it. In the corner of the horn paddock, nearest to the farm buildings, was a smallish fenced yard divided into a number of pens and runways. Here the sheep would be brought at shearing time, or to pick out fat lambs for market, or to be treated for various troubles. Farmer Hoggart had heard the old ewe cough, and he thought he would catch her up and give her another drench. He turned to give an order to fly lying flat and still behind him, and there, lying flat and still behind her, was the pig. Stay fly, said Hoggett, and just for fun, come pig. Immediately, Babe ran forward and sat at the farmer's right, his front trotters placed neatly together, his big ears cocked for the next command. Strange thoughts began to stir in Farmer Hoggett's mind, and unconsciously he crossed his fingers. He took a deep breath, and holding it, Away to me, pig, he said softly. Without a moment's hesitation, Babe began a long outrun to the right. Quite what Farmer Hoggett had expected to happen, he could not afterwards clearly remember. What he had not expected was that the pig would run round to the rear of the flock and then turn to face it and him and lie down instantly without a word of further command smoken, just as a well-trained dog would have done. Admittedly, with his jerky little rocking horse canter, he took twice as long to get there as Fly would have, but still there he was, in the right place, ready and waiting. Admittedly, the sheep had turned to face the pig and were making a great deal of noise, but then Farmer Hoggart did not know, and Fly would not listen to, what they were saying. He called the dog to heel and began to walk with his long loping stride to the collecting pen in the corner. Out in the middle of the paddock there was a positive babble of talk. "'Good morning,' said Babe. "'I do hope I find you all well and not too distressed by yesterday's experience.' and immediately it seemed that every sheep had something to say to him. "'Bless his heart!' they cried, "'and dear little soul! "'And hello, babe! "'And nice to see you again!' And then there was a rasping cough and the sound of Ma's hoarse horns. "'What's up then, young un? she croaked. "'What be you doing here instead of that wolf?' Although Babe wanted, literally, to keep on the right side of the sheep, his loyalty to his foster mother made him say in a rather hurt voice, She's not a wolf, she's a sheepdog. All right then, said Ma. Sheepdog, if you must have it, what dost want then? Babe looked at the army of long, sad faces. I want to be a sheep pig, he said. Ha ha ha! bleated a big lamb standing next to Ma. Ha 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 ha! Be quiet, said Ma sharply, swinging her head to give the lamb a thumping butt in the side. There ain't nothing to laugh at. Raising her voice, she addressed the flock. "'Listen to me, all you ewes,' she said, "'and lambs too. "'This young chap was kind to me, like I told you, "'when I were poorly, and I told him "'if he was to ask me to go somewhere "'or do something politely like he would, "'why, I'd be only too delighted. "'We ain't stupid,' I told him. "'All we want is to be treated right, "'and we as bright as an next piece we are.' We are, chorus the flock. We are, we are, we are. Right then, said Ma. What shall us do, babe? Babe looked across towards Farmer Hobbit, who had opened the gate of the collecting pen and now stood leaning on his crook, fly at his feet. The pen was in the left bottom corner of the paddock and saw Babe expected, and at that moment got, the command, come by pig, to send him left and so behind the sheep and thus down towards the corner. He cleared his throat. If I might ask a great favour of you, he said hurriedly, could you all be kind enough to walk down to that gate where the farmer is standing and to go through it? Take your time, please, there's absolutely no rush. A look of pure contentment passed over the faces of the flock, and with one accord they turned and walked across the paddock, babe a few paces in their rear. Sedately they walked, and steadily, over to the corner, through the gate, into the pen, and then stood quietly waiting. No one broke ranks or tried to slip away. No one pushed or shoved. There was no noise or fuss. From the oldest to the youngest they went in like lambs. Then at last a gentle murmur broke out as everyone in different ways quietly expressed their pleasure. Babe, said Fly to the pig, that was quite beautifully done, dear. Thank you so much, said Babe to the sheep. You did that so nicely. 
Da, said the sheep. Da, da, da. It is a pleasure. It is a pleasure to work with such a little gentleman. And Ma added, You'll make a wonderful sheep pig, young'un, when my name's not Ma. As for Farmer Hoggett, he heard none of this. So wrapped up was he in his own thoughts. He's as good as a dog, he told himself excitedly. He's better than a dog, than any dog. I, I wonder. Good pig, he said. Then he uncrossed his fingers and closed the gate. Chapter 7 What's Trials? Every day after that, of course, Babe went the rounds with Farmer Hoggett and Fly. At first the farmer worried about using the pig to herd the sheep, not because it was a strange and unusual thing to do, which people might laugh at. He did not care about that but because it was afraid that it might upset Fly and put her nose out of joint. However, it didn't seem to do so. He could have spared himself the worry if he'd been able to listen to their conversation. That was fun, said Babe to Fly that evening. I wonder if the boss will let me do some more work. I'm sure he will, dear. You did it so well. It was almost as though the sheep knew exactly what it was you wanted them to do. But that's just it. I asked them. No use asking sheep anything, dear, interrupted Fly. You have to make them do what you want. I've told you before. Yes, Mum, but will you mind if the boss uses me instead of you? Sometimes. Mind, said Fly. You bet your trotters I won't. All my life I've had to run round after those idiots, up hill, down dale, day in, day out. And as for sometimes, as far as I'm concerned, you can work them every day. I'm not as young as I was. I'll be only too happy to lie comfortably in the grass and watch you, my babe. And before long, that was exactly what she was doing. Once Farmer Hoggett could see by her wagging tail and smiling eyes that she was perfectly happy about it, he began to use Babe to do some of her work. At first he only gave the pig simple tasks, but as the days and weeks went by, Hoggett began to make more and more use of his new helper. The speed with which Babe learned amazed him, and before long he was relying on him for all the work with the flock, while Fly lay and proudly watched. Now there was nothing, it seemed, that the pig could not do, and do faultlessly at that. He obeyed all the usual commands immediately, and correctly. He could fetch sheep or take them away, move them to left or right, persuade them around obstacles or through gaps, cut the flock in half or take out one individual. To drench Ma, for instance, there was no need for Hoggett to bring all the sheep down to the collecting pen, or to corner them all and catch her by a hind leg with his crook. He could simply point her out to the pig and Babe would gently work her out of the bunch and bring her right to the farmer's feet, where she stood quietly waiting. It seemed like a miracle to Hoggart, but of course it was simple. Ma! Yes, young'un? The boss wants to give you some more medicine. Oh, not again. Tis horrible stuff, that. But it'll make your cough better. Oh, oh. Come along, Ma, please. All right then, young'un. Anything to oblige you. And there were other far more miraculous things that Babe could easily have done if the farmer had only known. For example, when it was time for the ewes to be separated from their lambs, now almost as big and strong as their mother's, Farmer Hoggett behaved like any other shepherd and brought the whole flock down to the pens and took a lot of time and trouble to part them. If only he'd been able to explain things to Babe how easy it could have been. Dear ladies, will you please stay on the hill if you be so kind? Youngsters, down you go to the collecting pen if you please. There's good boys and girls. And it could have been done in the shake of a lamb's tail. However, Babe's increasing skill at working sheep determined Farmer Hoggett to take the next step in a plan which had begun to form in his mind on the day when the piglet had first penned the sheep. That step was nothing less than to take Pig with him to the local sheepdog trials in a couple of weeks' time. Only just to watch, of course, just so that he could have a look at well-trained dogs working in a small number of sheep and see what they and their handlers were required to do. I'm daft, he thought, grinning to himself. He didn't tell his wife. Before the day came, he put a collar and lead on the pig. He could not risk him running away in a strange place. He kept him on the lead all one morning, letting Fly do the work as of old. He need not have bothered. Babe would have stayed tight at heel when told, but it was interesting to note the instant change in the atmosphere as the collie ran out. 
Wolf, wolf, cried the flock, every sheep immediately on edge. Move, fools, snapped Fly, as she hustled them and bustled them with little regard for their feelings. Babe, we want babe, they bleated. Babe! To be sure, the work was done more quickly, but at the end of it the sheep were in fear and trembling, and the dog out of patience and breath. Steady, steady, called the farmer a number of times, something that he never had to say to Babe. When the day came for the local trials, Farmer Hoggett set off early in the Land Rover, flying Babe in the back. He told his wife where he was going, though not what he was taking the pig, nor did he say that he didn't intend to be an ordinary spectator, but instead more of a spy to see without being seen. He wanted Pig to observe everything that went on without being spotted. Now that he'd settled on the final daring part of his plan, Hoggett realised that secrecy was all important. No one must know that he owned a... What would you call him, he thought? A she-pig, I suppose. The trials took place ten miles or so away in a curved basin-shaped valley in the hills. At the lower end of the basin was a road. Close to this was a starting point where the dogs would begin their outrun, and also the enclosure where they would finally pen their sheep. Down there all the spectators would gather. Farmer Hoggett, arriving some time before them, parked the Land Rover in a lane and set off up the valley by a roundabout way, keeping in the shelter of the bordering woods, Fly padding behind him, and Babe on the lead trotting to keep up with his long strides. "'Where are we going, Mum?' said Babe excitedly. "'What are we going to do?' "'I don't think we're going to do anything, dear,' said Fly. "'I think the boss wants you to see something.' "'What?' He reached the head of the valley now, and the farmer found a suitable place to stop, under cover, but with a good view of the course. Down fly, down pig, and stay, he said, and exhausted by this long speech, stretched his long frame on the ground and settled down to wait. Wants me to see what, said Babe. The trials. What's trials? Well, said Fly, it's a sort of competition for sheepdogs and their bosses. Each dog has to fetch five sheep and move them through a number of gaps and gateways. You can see which ones. They've got flags on either side, down to that circle that's marked out in a field right at the bottom, and where the dog has to shed more sheep. What shed mean? Separate them out from the rest. The ones to be shed will have collars on. And then what? Then the dog has to gather them all again and pen them. Is that all? It's not easy, dear. Not like moving that bunch of woolly fools of ours up and down a field. It all has to be done quickly, without any mistakes. You'll lose points if you make mistakes. Have you ever been in a trial, Mum? Yes, here, when I was younger. Did you make any mistakes? Of course, <laughs> said Fly. Everyone does. It's very difficult working a small number of strange sheep in strange country. You'll see. By the end of the day, Babe had seen a great deal. The course was not an easy one, and the sheep were very different from those at home. They were fast and wild, and good though the dogs were, there were many mistakes made, at the gates, in the shedding ring, at the final penning. Babe watched every run intently, and Hoggett watched Babe, and Fly watched them both. What's the boss up to, she thought, as they draw off home? He's surely never thinking that one day Babe might... No, he couldn't be that daft, sheep pig indeed. All right for the little chap to run round our place for a bit of fun, but to think of him competing in trials, even a little local one like today's, well, <laughs> really, she remembered something he'd said in his early duck herding days. I suppose you'd say, she remarked, that those dogs just weren't polite enough. That's right, said Babe. Chapter 8 Omar oh, Fly's suspicions about what the farmer was up to grew rapidly over the next weeks. It soon became obvious to her that he was constructing on his own land a practice course. From the top of the field where the russes had come, the circuit which he laid out ran all around the farm, studded with hazards to be negotiated. Some were existing gateways or gaps, some he made with hurdles or lines of posts between which the sheep had to be driven. Some were extremely difficult. One, for example, a plank bridge over a stream, was so narrow it could only be crossed in single file, and the most honeyed words were needed from Babe to persuade the animals to cross. Then, 
in the horn paddock, Hoggart made a rough shedding ring with a circle of large stones, and beyond it a final pen, a small hurdle enclosure no bigger than a tiny room, with a gate to close its mouth when he pulled on a rope. Every day the farmer would send Fly to cut out five sheep from the flock, and take them to the top of the hill, and hold them there. Then, starting Babe from the gate at the lower end of the farmyard, Hoggart would send him away to run them through the course. Away to me, pig, he would say, or come by, pig. And off Babe would scamper as fast as his trotters would carry him, as the farmer pulled out his big old pocket watch and noted the time. There was only one problem. His trotters wouldn't carry him all that fast. Here at home, Fly realised, his lack of speed didn't matter much. Whichever five sheep were selected were only too anxious to oblige Babe, and would hurry eagerly to do whatever he wanted. But with strange sheep it will be different, thought Fly, if the boss really does intend to run him in a trial. Which it looks as though he does. She watched his tubby, pinky-white shape as he crested the hill. That evening at supper time, she watched again as he tucked into his food. Up till now, it never worried her how much he ate. He's a growing boy, she thought fondly. Now she thought, he's a greedy boy too. Babe, she said, as with a grunt of content he licked the last morsels off the end of his snout. His little tin trough was as shiningly clean as though Mrs. Hoggett had washed it in a sink, and his tummy was tight as a drum. Yes, ma'am. You like being a sheep pig, don't you? Oh, yes, ma'am. And you'd like to be really good at it, wouldn't you? The greatest. Better than any other sheep pig. Do you think there are any others? Well, no. Better than any sheep dog, then. Oh, yes, I'd love to be. But I don't really think that's possible. You see, although sheep do seem to go very well for me and, and do what I ask... I mean, do what I tell them. I'm lucky, nothing like as fast as a dog, and never would be. No, but you could be a jolly sight faster than you are. How? Well, there are two things you'd have to do, dear, said Fly. First, you'd have to go into proper training. One little run and round a day is not enough. You have to practice hard. Jogging, cross-country running, sprinting, distance work. I'd help you, of course. It all sounded fun to Babe. Great, he said. But you said two things. What's the second? Eat less, said Fly. You'd have to go on a diet. Any ordinary pig would have rebelled at this point. Pigs enjoy eating, and they also enjoy lying around most of the day thinking about eating again. But Babe was no ordinary pig, and he set out enthusiastically to do what Fly suggested. Under her watchful eye, he ate wisely, but not too well, and every afternoon he trained to a program which she had worked out, trotting right round the boundaries of the farm, perhaps, or running to the top of the hill and back again, or racing up and down the horn paddock. Hoggart thought the pig was just playing, but he couldn't help noticing how he had grown, not fatter, as a sty-kept pig would have done, but stronger and wirier. There was nothing of the piglet about him any more. He looked lean and racy and hard-muscled, and he was now almost as big as the sheep he herded. And the day came when that strength and hardness were to stand him in good stead. One beautiful morning, when the sky was clear and cloudless, and the air so crisp and fresh that you could almost taste it, Babe Walk, feeling on top of the world, like a trained athlete, he felt so charged with energy that he simply couldn't keep still. He bounced about the stable floor on all four feet, shaking his head about and uttering a series of short, sharp squeaks. "'You're full of it this morning,' said Fly with a yawn. "'You'd better run to the top of the hill and back to work it off.' "'OK, Mum,' said Babe, and off he shot, while Fly settled comfortably back into the straw. Dashing across the horn paddock, Babe bounded up the hill and looked about for the sheep. Though he knew he would see them later on, he felt so pleased with life that he thought he would like to share that feeling with Ma and all the others before he ran home again. Just to say, hello, good morning everybody, isn't it a lovely day? They were, he knew, in the most distant of all the fields on the farm, right away up at the top of the lane. 
He looked across, expecting that they would be grazing quietly or lying comfortably and cuddling in the morning sun, only to see them galloping madly in every direction. On the breeze came cries of wolf, but not in the usual bored, almost automatic tones of complaint that they used when fly worked them. These were yells of real terror, desperate calls for help. As he watched, two other animals came in sight, one large, one small, and he heard the sound of barking and yapping as they dashed about after the fleeing sheep. "'You get some wolves as a chase sheep and kill them!' Ma's exact words came back to Babe, and without a second thought he set off as fast as he could in the direction of the noise. What a sight greeted him when he arrived in the far field! The flock, usually so tightly bunched, was scattered everywhere, eyes bulging, mouths open, heads hanging in their evident distress, and it was clear that the dogs had been at their worrying for some time. A few sheep had tried in their terror to jump the wire fencing, and had become caught up in it. Some had fallen into the ditches and got stuck, some were limping as they ran about, and on the grass were lumps of wool torn from others. Most dreadful of all, in the middle of the field, the worriers had brought down a ewe, which lay on its side feebly, kicking at them as they growled and tugged at it. On the day when the rustles had come, Babe had felt a mixture of fear and anger. Now he knew nothing but a blind rage, and he charged flat out at the two dogs, grunting and snorting with fury. Nearest to him was a smaller dog, a kind of mongrel terrier, which was snapping at one of the ewe's hind legs, deaf to everything in the excitement of the worry. Before it could move, Babe took it across the back and flung it to one side, and the forces of his rush carried him on into the bigger dog and knocked it flying. This one, a large black crossbred, part collie, part retriever, was made of sterner stuff than the terrier, which was already running dazedly away, and it picked itself up and came snarling back at the pig. Perhaps in the confusion of the moment, it thought that this was just another sheep that had somehow found courage to attack it. But if so, it soon knew better, for as it came on, Babe chopped at it with his terrible pig's bite, the bite that grips and tears, and now it was not sheep's blood that was spilled. Howling in pain, the black dog turned and ran, its tail between its legs. He ran, in fact, for his life, an open-mouthed, bristling pig hard on his heels. The field was clear, and Babe suddenly came back to his senses. He turned and hurried to the fallen ewe, round whom now the dogs had gone, the horrified flock was beginning to gather in a rough circle. She lay still now, as Babe stood panting by her side, a draggled side where the worries had pulled at it, and suddenly he realised it was Ma. Ma! he cried. Ma! Are you all right? She did not seem too badly hurt. He could not see any gaping wounds, though blood was coming from one ear where the dogs had bitten it. The old ewe opened an eye. Her voice, when she spoke, was as hoarse as ever, but now not much more than a whisper. "'Hello, young un,' she said. Babe dropped his head and gently licked the ear to try and stop the bleeding, and some blood stuck to his snout. "'Can you get up?' he asked. For some time... Ma did not answer, and he looked anxiously at her, but the eye he could still see was open. "'I don't reckon,' she said. "'It's all right, Ma,' Babe said. "'The wolves have gone far away.' "'Far, far, far,' chorused the flock. "'And Fly and the Boss will soon be here to look after you.' Ma made no answer or movement. Only her ribs jumped to the thump of her tired old heart. "'You'll be all right. Honestly, you will,' said Babe. "'Oh, are,' said Ma, and then the eye closed and the ribs jumped no more. "'Oh, Ma!' said Babe, and Ma, 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 mourned the flock as the Land Rover came up the lane. Farmer Hoggett had heard nothing of the worrying. The field was too far away, the wind in the wrong direction, but he had been anxious, and saw by now would fly, because Pig was nowhere to be found. The moment they entered the field, both man and dog could see that something was terribly wrong. Why else was the flock so obviously distressed, panting and gasping and dishevelled? Why had they formed that ragged circle, and what was in the middle of it? 
Farmer Hoggett strode forward, fly before him parting the ring to make way, only to see a sight that struck horror into the hearts of both. There before them lay a dead ewe, and bending over it was the pig, his snout almost touching the outstretched neck, a snout they saw that was stained with blood. Chapter 9 Was it, babe? Go home, pig said Farmer Hoggart, in a voice that was so quiet and cold that Babe hardly recognised it. Bewildered, he trotted off obediently, while behind him the farmer picked up the dead ewe and carried it to the Land Rover. Then, with Fly's help, he began the task of rescuing no sheep that were caught or stuck, and of making sure that no others were badly hurt. This done, he left Fly to guard the flock and draw off home. Back at the farm, Babe felt simply very, very sad. The sky was still cloudless, the air still crisp, but this was a very different pig from the one that had cantered carefree up the hill not half an hour ago. In those thirty minutes, he had seen naked fear and cruelty and death, and now to cap it all, the boss was angry with him and had sent him home in some sort of disgrace. What had he done wrong? He had only done his duty as a good sheep pig should. He sat in the doorway of the stables and watched as the Land Rover drove into the yard. Poor Ma's head was lolling loosely over the back. He saw the boss get out and go into the house, and then a few minutes later come out again carrying something in the crook of one arm, a kind of long thing, a kind of black shiny tube, and walk towards him. Come, pig said Farmer Hoggett, in that same cold voice, and strode past him into the stables, while at the same moment inside the farmhouse the telephone began to ring, and then stopped as Mrs. Hoggett picked it up. Obediently, Babe followed the farmer into the dark interior. It was not so dark, however, that he could not see clearly that the boss was pointing the black shiny tube at him, and he sat down and he weirded it, supposing that perhaps it was some machine for giving out food and that some quite unexpected surprise would come out of its two small round mouths held now quite close to his face at that instant mrs hoggett's voice sounded across the yard calling her husband's name from the open kitchen window he frowned and lowered the shiny tube and poked his head around the stable door oh there you are called Mrs. Hoggett. What does think then? That was the police, that was. They were ringing every farmer in the district to warn them. they sheep-wearing dogs about. They killed six sheep to the side of the valley only last night. They've been seen, they have. They, they, two, they've been seen. Two of them. Tis a big black un and a little brown un. And they say to shoot them on sight. If you do see them, you better get back up that hill and make sure ours is all right. Do you want me to fetch your gun? No, said Farmer Hoggett. It's all right, he said. He waited until his wife had shut the window and disappeared, and then he walked out into the sunlight with Beard following. Sit, pig, he said, but now his voice was warm and kindly again. He looked closely at the trusting fears turned up to his, and saw, sticking out of the side of his babe's mouth, some hairs, some black hairs, and a few brown ones too. He shook his head in wonder, and that slow grin sped across his face. I reckon you gave them sight to worry about, he said, and he brought the gun and took out the cartridges. Meanwhile, Fly, standing guard up in that far field, was terribly agitated. She knew, of course, that some dogs will attack sheep, sometimes even the very dogs trained to look after them, but surely not her sheep pig. Surely Babe could not have done such a thing. Yet there he had been at the centre of that scene of chaos, blood-stained and standing over a dead ewe. What would the boss do to him? What perhaps had he already done? Yet she could not leave these fools to find out. At least, though, she suddenly realised they could tell her what had happened, if the shock hadn't driven what little sense they had out of their stupid heads. Never before in her long life would fly sunk to engaging a sheep in conversation, they were there to be ordered about, like soldiers, and, like soldiers, never to answer back. She approached the nearest one with distaste, and it promptly backed away from her. "'Stand still, fool!' she barked. "'And tell me who chased you. Who killed that old one?' "'Wolf!' said the sheep automatically. Fly growled with annoyance. "'Was that the only word the halfwits knew?' She put the question differently. "'Was it the pig that chased you? Was it Babe?' she said. "'Babe!' 
bleated the sheep eagerly. What's that mean, bonehead? barked Fly. Was it or wasn't it? Wolf, said the sheep. Somehow Fly controlled her anger at the creature's stupidity. I must know what happened, she thought. Babe's always talking about being polite to these woolly idiots. I'll have to try it. I must know. She took a deep breath. Please, she said. The sheep, which had begun to graze, raised its head sharply and stared at her with an expression of total amazement. Say that again, again, it said, and a number of others overhearing moved towards the collie. Please, said Fly, swallowing hard. Could you be kind enough to tell me? Hark, interrupted the fur sheep. Hark, hark! whereupon the whole flock ran and gathered around. They stood in silence, every eye fixed wonderingly on her, every mouth hanging open. Nincompoops, thought Fly. Just when I wanted to ask one quietly, the whole fat-headed lot come round. But I must know, I must know the truth about my babe, however terrible it is. Please, she said once more, in a voice choked with the effort of being humble. Could you be kind enough to tell me what happened this morning? Did Babe... But she got no further, for at the mention of the pig's name, the whole flock burst out into a great cry of, Babe! Listening for the first time ever to what the sheep were actually saying, Fly could hear individual voices competing to make themselves heard in what was nothing less than a hymn of praise. Babe came! He saved us! He drove the wolves away! He made them pay, hip hip hooray, hip hip hooray, hip hip hooray. What a sense of relief flooded over her as she heard and understood the words of the sheep. It had been sheep warriors after all, and her boy had come to the rescue. He was not the villain, he was the hero. Hoggett and Babe heard the racket as they climbed the hill, and the farmer sent the pig ahead, fearing that perhaps the warriors had returned. Under cover of the noise, Babe arrived on the scene unnoticed by Fly, just in time to hear her reply. Oh, thank you, she cried to the flock. Thank you all so much for telling me. How kind of you. Gosh, ma'am, said a voice behind her. What's come over you? Chapter 10. Get it off my heart. Because Babe had now saved the flock not only from rustlers but also from the worriers, the hoggets could not do too much for him. Because he was a pig, though Farmer Hoggett increasingly found himself thinking of pig as dog and fed him accordingly, they gave him unlimited supplies of what they supposed he could not have too much of, namely food. Because he was strong-minded and revelled in his newfound speed, he ate sparingly of it. Because there was always a lot left over, Fly became fat, and the chickens chubby, and the ducks dumpy, and the very rats and mice roared happily about in the stables with stomachs full to bursting. Mrs. Hoggart even took to call him Babe to the back door, to feed him some tidbit or other that she thought he might particularly fancy, and from here it was but a short step to inviting him into the house, which one day she did. When the farmer came in for his tea, he found not only Fly, but also Pig lying happily asleep beside the yoga cooker. And afterwards, when he sat down in his armchair in the sitting room and switched on the television, Babe came to sit beside him, and they watched the six o'clock news together. He likes it said Hoggett to his wife when she came into the room. Mrs. Hoggett nodded her head a great many times and, as usual, had a few words to say on the subject. Dear little chap, though you can't call him little no longer, he grows so much, why he's big enough to you know what, not that he ever shall now, or oh, my dead body though, I hopes it ain't if you do know what I see though what I mean, just look at him, he should have brought him in the house long time ago, no reason why not is there now. He might miss the carpet, said Farmer Hoggett. Never, cried Mrs. Hoggett, shaking her head the entire time that she was speaking.
He no more likely to mess than he is to fly. I'll ask it go out when he does do his do's. He's like a good clean dog would. Got more brains than a dog he has. Why, it wouldn't surprise me the ear he was rounding up them sheep with urine. It wouldn't, honestly. No, I suppose you think I'm daft. Farmer Hoggett grinned to himself. He did not tell his wife what she had never yet noticed, that all the work of the farm was now done by the sheep pig and he had no intention of telling her of the final part of his plan which was nothing less than to enter the pig in that sternest of all tests the grand challenge sheep dog trials open to all comers never in his working life had he owned an animal good enough to compete in those trials now at last he had one and it was not going to be stopped from realising his ambition by the fact that it was a pig in a couple of weeks, they would be competing against the best sheepdogs in the country, would be appearing, in fact, on that very television screen they were now watching. No, you're not daft, he said. But you wouldn't half get a surprise when you sit here and watch it, he thought. And so will a lot of other folks. His plan was simple. He would appear at the Grand Challenge trials with Fly, and at the last possible moment, swap her for Pig. By then it would be too late for anyone to stop him. It didn't matter what happened afterwards. They could disqualify him, fine him, send him to prison, anything, as long as he could run pig. Just one glorious run, just to show them all. And they couldn't say they hadn't been warned. The name was there in the entry form. He had been worried, for he was a truthful man, that the heading might say, Name of Dog, and then whatever he put would be a lie. But he'd been lucky. Name of Competitor, the form said. A simple truth. Shepherds usually gave their dogs short names like Jip or Moss. It's so much quicker and easier than shouting Bartholomew or Wilhelmina. And though someone might say Pig, that's a funny name. No one in their wildest dreams would guess the simple truth. The two weeks before the Grand Challenge trials were two weeks of concentrated activity. Apart from Mrs. Hoggard, who as usual was busy with household duties, everyone now knew what was going on. To begin with, Hoggard altered the practice course, cutting out all the frills like the plank bridge over the stream, and building a new course as like as possible to what they thought he might face on that day. As soon as Fly saw this, she became convinced that the plan to which she had suspected was actually going to be put into operation, and she told the sheep, with whom she was now on speaking terms. Every night, of course, she and Babe talked endlessly about the coming challenge before they settled to sleep, in the stable still, though the Hoggets would have been perfectly happy for Babe to sleep in the house, so well-mannered was he. Thoughtful as ever, Babe was anxious, not about his own abilities, but about his foster mother's feelings. He felt certain she would have given her dog teeth to compete in the national trials, the dream of every sheepdog, yet she must sit and watch him. "'Are you sure you don't mind, ma'am?' he asked. Fly's reply was as practical as ever. "'Listen, babe,' she said. First of all, it wouldn't matter whether I mind it or not. "'The boss is going to run you, no doubt of it. Second, I'm too old and too fat. "'And anyway, I was only ever good enough for small local competitions. "'And lastly, I'll be the happiest collie in the world if you win. "'And you can win.' Do you really think so? I'm sure of it, said Fly firmly. But all the same, she was anxious too, about one thing. She knew that the sheep pig, speedy as he now was, would still be much slower than the dogs, especially on the outrun. But equally she was confident that he could make this up by the promptness with which the sheep obeyed his requests. Here at home, they shot through gaps or round obstacles as quick as a flash, never putting a foot wrong. The ones to be shed nipped out of the ring like lightning, and at the final penning they popped in the instant the boss opened the gate. But that was here, at home. What would strange sheep do? How would they react to Babe? Would he be able to communicate with them, in time, for there would be none to waste? She determined to ask the flock, and one evening, when Babe and the boss were watching television, she trotted off up the hill. Since that first time when she had been forced to speak civilly to them, they no longer cried wolf at her, and now they gathered around attentively at her first words, words that were carefully polite. "'Good evening,' said Fly. "'I wonder if you could be kind enough to help me. I've a little problem.' 
and she explained it, speaking slowly and carefully, for she was stupid, she said to herself. Nobody will ever persuade me otherwise. You see what I mean, she finished. There they'll be, these strange sheep, and I'm sure they'll do what he tells them, asks them, I mean, eventually, but it'll take time explaining things. The last creature they'll be expecting to see is a pig, and they might just bolt at the sight of him before he even gets a chance to speak to them. Password, said several voices. What do you mean? Fly said. Password, 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 said many voices now, speaking slowly and carefully. For wolves are stupid, they said to themselves. Nobody will ever persuade us otherwise. What our babes to do, said one, is to learn what all of us learned when we was little lambs. "'Tis a saying, see,' said another, "'as lambs do learn at their mother's hocks. "'And then wherever we do go, to market or to another farm, "'we will never come to no harm as long as we do say the password. "'And if our babe do say it to they, why then they won't never run away.'" Fly felt her patience slipping. But she controlled herself, knowing how important this information could be. Please, she said quietly, please will you tell me the password? For a long moment the flock stood silent, the only movement a turning of heads as they looked at one another. Fly could sense that they were nerving themselves to tell this age-old secret, to give away, to a wolf of all things, this treasured countersign. Then, tis for a babe, someone said. It is for his sake. Arr, they all said softly. Arr. And then with one voice they began to intone. I may be you, I may be ram, I may be blun, I may be lamb, but on the hoof or on the hook, I bain't no stupid as I look. Then by general consent they began to move away, grazing as they went. Is that it? called Fly after them. Is that the password? And the murmur came back. Arr! But what's it all mean, Mum? said Babe that night when she told him. All that stuff about I may be you and other words I don't understand. It doesn't make sense to me. That doesn't matter, dear, said Fly. You just get it off by heart. It may make all the difference on the day. Chapter 11 Today is the day. The day when it dawned was just that little bit too bright. On the opposite side of the valley, the trees and houses and haystacks stood out clearly against the background in that three-dimensional way that means rain later. Farmer Hogger came out and sniffed the air and looked around. Then he went inside again to fetch waterproof clothing. Fly knew the moment that she set eyes on the boss, that this was the day. Dogs have lived so long with humans that they know what's going to happen, sometimes even before their owners do. She woke Babe. Today, she said. Today what, Mum? said Babe sleepily. Today's the day of the Grand Challenge Sheepdog Trials, said Fly proudly. Which you, dear, she added in a confident voice, are going to win. With a bit of luck, she thought, and tenderly she licked the end of his snout. She looked critically at the rest of them, anxious as any mum that her child should be well turned out if it is to appear in public. Oh, babe, she said, your coat's in an awful mess. What have you been doing with yourself? You look as though you've been wallowing in the duck pond. Yes. You mean you have? Yes, ma'am. Fly was on the point of saying that puppies don't do such things when she remembered that he was, after all, a pig. Well, I don't know about large white, she said. You've certainly grown enormous, but that's anyone's guess what colour you are under all that muck. Whatever's to be done? Immediately her question was answered. Come, pig, said Hoggett's voice from the yard, and when they came out of the stables, there stood the farmer with hosepipe and scrubbing brush and pails of soapy water. Half an hour later, when a beautifully clean, shining babe stood happily dripping while Hoggett 
brushed out the tassel of his tight curled tail till it looked like candy floss. Mrs. Hoggett stuck her head out the kitchen window. Breakfast ready, she called. But what in the world be still with that pig? Taking in pig shows, Summit. I thought you was going to drive up and watch trials today. Anybody think you was going into the room in the way you've got him all done up and oh my god, you he doesn't look like a sheep dog. He'd be a sheep pig, wouldn't he? He de he 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 Whoever heard of such a thing? I might just be daft though. It's you that's daft really, carrying him about in that poor Land Rover, the size he is now, bottom fall out. Shouldn't wonder. You ain't surely gonna drive him all that way with him in the back just so as he can watch. No, said Farmer Hoggett. Mrs. Hoggett considered this answer for a moment with her mouth open, while raising and lowering her eyebrows, shaking her head and drumming on the window sill with her fingertips. Then she closed her mouth and the window. After breakfast, she came out to see them off. Fly was sitting in the passenger seat. Babe was comfortable in a thick bed of clean straw in the back, of which he now took up the whole space. Mrs. Hoggett walked round the Land Rover, giving out farewell pats. Good boy, she said to Babe, and good girl, to Fly, and to Hoggett. Good boy, and have you got your sandwiches and your thermos of coffee and your raincoat? Looks as if it might rain. Thought I felt a spot just now, though I suppose it might be different where you're going, seeing as it's hundred miles away. That reminds me, have you got enough petrol? Or if not, money to get some if you haven't. If you do, see, do what I mean. Drive carefully. See you later. Two o'clock, said Hoggett, and before his wife had time to say anything, he added, On the telly. Dive, and he put the hat and drover into gear and drove away. When Mrs. Hoggett switched on the television at two o'clock, the first thing in the picture that she noticed was that it was raining hard. She dashed outside to fetch her washing in, saw the sun was shining, remembered it wasn't washing day anyway, and came back to find the cameras showing the layout of the course. First there was a shot of a huge pillar of stone, the height of a man standing upright in the ground. Here, said the voice of the commentator, is where each handler will stand, and from here each dog will start his outrun. He can go left or right to get into position behind his sheep. Today each dog will have ten sheep to work. They will be grouped near that distant post called the holding post. All the time the cameras followed his explanations. And then he must fetch his sheep through the fetch gates all the way back to handler's post and round it and then the dog drives the sheep away to the left as we look at it and through the drive away gates turns them right again and straight across the line of his fetch though through through the cross drive gates and right again to the shedding ring and when he shed his sheep and collected them again then finally he must pen them here mow the old thing said mrs hoggett turning the sound off some folk never knew no, do no know how to hold their tongues keep on and on about them silly gates why don't he just show us a picture of spectators might catch a glimpse of hoggett and fly he never knows though not peg i hopes he's surely not daft enough to walk about with a pig can't see why he wanted to take him all the way just to lie in the back of the land rover he might have done better to leave an ear and then let him sit and watch telly in front of comfort which is more than some of us got time for i got work to do and she stumped off to the kitchen, shaking her head madly. On the silent screen, the first handler walked out and stood up in his position behind the great sarsen stone, his dog standing by him, tense and eager in the pouring rain. Chapter 12 That'll do Hundreds of thousands of pairs of eyes watched that first dog, but none more keenly than those of Hoggett, Fly and Babe. Car park was a big sloping field overlooking the course, and the farmer had driven the Land Rover to the topmost corner, well away from other cars. From inside it, the three saw different faces watched intently. Conditions, Hoggett could see immediately, were very difficult. In addition to the driving rain, which made the going slippery and the sheep more obstinate than usual, there was a strong wind blowing almost directly from the holding post back towards the handler, and the dog was finding it hard to hear commands. The more anxious the dog was, the more the sheep tried to break from him, and thus the angrier he became. It was a vicious circle, and when at last the ten sheep were penned and the handler pulled the gate shut and cried, That'll do, no one was surprised that they had scored no more than seventy points out of a possible hundred. And so it went on. 
Man after man came to stand beside the great sarsen stone, men from the north and from the west, from Scotland and Wales and Ireland, with dogs and bitches, large and small, rough-coated and smooth, black and white, or grey and brown, or blue merle. Some fared better than others, of course, were steadier on their sheep, or had steadier sheep to deal with. But still, as Farmer Hoggett's turn grew near, as luck would have it, he was last to go. There was no score higher than eighty-five. At home, Mrs. Hoggett chanced to turn the sound of the television back up in time to hear the commentator confirm this. "'One more to go,' he said, "'and the target to beat is eighty-five points, set by Mr. Jones from Wales and his dog Bryn. A very creditable total, considering the appalling weather conditions we have up here today. It's very difficult to see that score being beaten, but here comes the last competitor to try and do just that.' And suddenly there appeared on the screen before Mrs. Hoggett's astonished eyes the tall, long-striding figure of her husband walking out towards the great storm with tubby old fly at his heels. "'And this is Mr. Hoggett with Pig,' said the commentator. "'A bit of a strange name, that, but then again I must say this dog's rather on the fat side. Hello, he's sending the dog back. What on earth? Oh, good heavens, will you look at that?' As Mrs. Hoggett and hundreds of thousands of other viewers looked, they saw Fly go trotting back towards the car park, and from it, cantering through the never-ending rain, came the long, lean, beautifully clean figure of a large white pig. Straight to Hoggett's side ran Babe, and stood like a statue, his grey ears fanned, his little eyes fixed upon the distant sheep. At home, Mrs. Hoggett's mouth opened wide, but for once nor sound came from it. On the course there was a moment of stunned silence, and then a great burst of noise. On the screen, the camera showed every aspect of the amazing scene. The spectators pointing, gaping, grinning, the red-faced judges hastily conferring, Hoggett and Babe waiting patiently, and finally the commentator. "'This is really quite ridiculous,' he said with a shamefaced smile. But in point of fact, there seems to be nothing in the rule book that says that only sheepdogs may compete. So it looks as though the judges are bound to allow Mr. Hoggett to run this, uh, sheep pig, I suppose we'll have to call it. Ha <laughs> ha! One look at it and the sheep will disappear into the next county without a doubt. Still, we might as well end the day with a good laugh. Ha <laughs> ha! And indeed, at that moment, a great gale of laughter arose as Hoggett, receiving a most unwilling nod from the judges, said quietly, Away to me, pig. And Babe began his outrun to the right. How they roared at the mere sight of him running, though many noticed how fast he went, and at the purely crazy thought of a pig herding sheep and especially at the way he squealed and squealed at the top of his voice in foolish excitement they supposed but though he was excited tremendously excited at the thrill of actually competing in the grand challenge sheepdog trials babe was nobody's fool he was yelling out the password i may be you i may be ram i may be mutton i may be lamb but on the hoof or on the hook i bain't so stupid as i look he hollered as he ran. This was the danger point. Before he'd met his sheep, and again and again, he repeated the magic words, shouting above the noise of wind and rain, his eyes fixed on the ten sheep by the holding post. Their eyes were just as fixed on him, eyes that bulged at the sight of this great strange animal approaching. But they held steady, and the now distant crowd fell suddenly silent as they saw the pig take up a perfect position behind his sheep, and heard the astonished judges award ten points for a faultless outrun. Just for luck, in case they hadn't believed their ears, Babe gave the password one last time. I bain't so stupid as I look, he panted, and a very good afternoon to you all, and I do apologise for having to ask you to work in this miserable weather. I hope you'll forgive me. At once, as he had hoped, there was a positive babble of voices. Fancy him knowing the password. What lovely manners, not like them nasty wolves. What you want us to do, young master? Quickly, for he was conscious that time was ticking away, Babe, first asking politely for their attention, outlined the course to them. And I would really be most awfully grateful, he said, if you would bear all these points in mind, keep tightly together, go at a good, steady pace, not too fast and not too slow, and walk exactly through the middle of each of the three gates, if you'd be good enough. 
The moment I enter the shedding ring, with the four of you who are wearing collars, and how light, nice they look, by the way, please walk out of it. And then if you'd all kindly go straight to the final pen, I would be very much obliged. All this talk took quite a time, and the crowd and the judges of Mrs. Hoggett and her hundreds of thousands of fellow viewers began to feel that nothing else was going to happen, that the sheep were never going to move, that the whole thing was a stupid farce, a silly jork that had fallen flat. Only Hoggett, standing silent in the rain beside the sarsenstorn, had complete confidence in the skills of the sheep pig. And suddenly the miracle began to happen. Marching two by two, as steady as guardsmen on parade, the ten sheep set off for the fetch gates, babe a few paces behind them, silent, powerful, confident. Straight as a die they went towards the distant hoggart, straight between the exact centre of the fetch gates, without a moment's hesitation, without deviating an inch from their unswerving course. Hoggett said nothing, made no sign, gave no whistle, did not move as the sheep rounded him so closely as almost to brush his boots, and, the fetch completed, set off for the driveway gates. Once again, their pace never changing, looking neither left nor right, keeping so tight a formation that you could have dropped a big tablecloth over the lot, they passed through the precise middle of the driveway gates, and turned as one animal to face the cross drive gates. It was just the same here. The sheep passed through perfectly and wheeled for the Shetton ring, while all the time the judge's scorecards showed maximum points and the crowd watched in a kind of hypnotised hush, whispering to one another for fear of breaking the spell. He's not put a foot wrong. Bang through the middle of every gate. Lovely, said he, pays. And the handler, he not said a word, not even moved, just stood there leaning on his stick. Ah, but he'll have to move now. Never go and tell me that pig can shed four sheep out of the ten on his own. The shedding ring was a circle perhaps forty yards in diameter, marked out by little heaps of sawdust, and into it the sheep walked, still calm, still collected, and stood waiting. Outside the circle, Babe waited, his eyes on Hoggart. The crowd waited, Mrs. Hoggart waited. Hundreds of thousands of viewers waited. Then, just as it seemed nothing more would happen, that the man had somehow lost control of the sheep pig, that the sheep pig had lost interest in his sheep, Farmer Hoggart raised his stick, and with it gave one sharp tap upon the great sarsen stone, a tap that sounded like a pistol shot in the tense atmosphere. And at this signal, Babe walked gently into the circle and up to his sheep. "'Beautifully done!' he said to them quietly. I can't tell you how grateful I am to you all. Now, if the four ladies with collars would kindly walk out of the ring when I give a grunt, I'd be so much obliged. And then if you would all be good enough to wait until my boss has walked across the final collecting pen over there and opened its gate, all that remains for you is to pop in. Will you do that, please? Arr they said softly, and as Babe gave one deep grunt, the four coloured sheep detached themselves from their companions and calmly, unhurriedly, walked out of the shedding ring. Unmoving, held by the magic of the moment, the crowd watched with no sound but a great sigh of amazement. No one could quite believe his eyes. No one seemed to notice that the wind had dropped and the rain had stopped. No one was surprised when a single shaft of sunshine came suddenly through a hole in the grey clouds and shone full upon the great sarsen stone. Slowly, with his long strides, Hoggett left it and walked to the little enclosure of hurdles, the final test of his shepherding. He opened his gate and stood, silent still, while the shed animals walked back into the ring to rejoin the rest. Then he nodded once at Babe, no more, and steadily, smartly, straightly, the ten sheep with the sheep pig at their heels marched into the final pen, and Hoggart closed the gate. As he dropped the loop of the rope over the hurdle stake, everyone could see the judge's marks. A hundred out of a hundred, the perfect performance, never before matched by man and dog in the whole history of sheepdog trials, but now achieved by man and pig, and every one went mad. 
At home, Mrs. Hoggett erupted, like a volcano, into a great lava flow of words, pouring them out towards two figures held by the camera, as though they were actually inside that box in the corner of her sitting room, cheering them, praising them, congratulating first and then the other, telling them how proud she was to hurry home, not to be late for supper. It was Shepherd's Pie. As for the crowd of spectators at the Grand Challenge Sheepdog Trials, they shouted, and yelled, and waved their arms and jumped about, while the astonished judges scratched their heads and the amazed competitors shook theirs in wondering disbelief. Marvellous! Marvellous! bleated the ten pen sheep, and from the back of an ancient Land Rover at the top of the car park, a tubby old black and white collie bitch, her plumed tail wagging wildly, barked and barked and barked for joy. In all the hubbub, of noise and excitement. Two figures still stood silently side by side. Then Hoggett bent, and gently scratching Bay between his great ears, uttered those words that every handler always says to his working companion when the job is finally done. Perhaps no one else heard the words, but there was no doubting the truth of them. That'll do, said Farmer Hoggett to his sheep pig. That'll do.